Okay, hi everyone. Good evening. Welcome to Equal Pay for Equal Play. My name is Andy Fields. I am the Programs Chair for the Beverly Hills Bar Association Labor and Employment Law Section. I'm an associate at the Jeannie Harrison Law Firm. We have an exciting program for you tonight. We will reserve time at the end of this program for questions, so please feel free to use the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen if you have questions. After this program ends, you should all receive an email from the Beverly Hills Bar Association for your MCLE credit. Please check out the Beverly Hills Bar Association website for news and information about our upcoming webinars and mixers. If you have any questions about the labor and employment law section, please feel free to reach out to our chair, Jennifer Ostertag. I am one of the attorneys who had the privilege of representing the women of Riot Games in the McCracken versus Riot Games Inc. case. I've had the unique pleasure to work with Jeannie Harrison, Nick Saris, and Mia Monroe to litigate this case to settlement. Jeannie Harrison, the founder of the Jeannie Harrison Law Firm, is a top women's rights lawyer handling sexual harassment, equal pay, and other employment cases. Jeannie was counsel for Harvey Weinstein's former personal assistant in her sexual harassment case and for other women against Weinstein. Jeannie was part of the team that secured $17 million for the Weinstein victims. Jeannie was the 2021 president of the Consumer Attorneys Association of Los Angeles. She has been listed for seven years by super lawyers as one of the top 10 Southern California super lawyers. Best Lawyers in America named her the 2022 Plaintiff's Employment Lawyer of the Year in Los Angeles. Law Dragon consistently names Jeannie as one of the top 500 leading plaintiff's lawyers in the country. California's Daily Journal lists Jeannie as one of the plaintiff's side top labor and employment lawyers in the state and one of the top 100 lawyers in California. We're lucky to have her here tonight. Nick Saris is the co-managing partner of JML Law and has been practicing in the field of employment law for the entirety of his career. Nick began his career representing employees and subsequently transitioned to representing management in employment litigation. After nearly a decade of representing management and an associate and partner at two national law firms, Nick returned to representing employees and joined JML Law as a partner in 2017. During the course of his career, Nick has first chaired numerous trials and arbitrations re resulting in favorable verdicts for his clients, including his October 2021 $7.1 million verdict on behalf of a whistleblower. Nick also has several published appellate decisions to his credit. We're lucky to have him here tonight. Mia Monroe is a litigation attorney at Jeannie Harrison Law Firm. Mia employed Mia represents employees to enforce their rights against discrimination, harassment, retaliation, and wage and hour violations in the workplace. Mia has been an employment civil rights litigator in Los Angeles since, since 2013. Prior to that, Mia practiced for two years at Equal Rights Advocates, a women's rights impact litigation organization in San Francisco. Mia graduated with honors from New York University of School of Law and University of Pennsylvania School of Arts and Sciences. Southern California Super Lawyers has recognized Mia as a Rising Star honoree for the last three years. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. Jeannie. Okay, thanks Andy. And we're excited to be here to share um, some thoughts about these kinds of cases and, and a bit of information about how things uh, proceeded in this case. Um, and so I wanted to start by, by pointing out some big picture information, which, you know, people who practice in this area certainly have in mind, but the reality is that because of the gender pay gap, women just have less money for a rainy day. They have less money to buy a house. They have, they're, um, not able to save the same amount of money as men in general. It is a pervasive systemic nationwide problem. This slide and the next couple of slides are actually fantastic. And from the American Association of University Women, it's the AAUW, I commend to you their website, which is aauw.com. It has a tremendous amount of information. That organization uh, focuses on promoting equity and education for women and girls. So if we can go to the next slide, Andy. <clears throat> yeah, so here is actually, an, the, I should tell you that the previous slide had information from 2020. This has information, um, it only goes back on a slide like this to 2018. And lest you think that it's not so bad in California, well, it is. If we can go back to LA, the prior slide, Andy, 
Um, so you see that, that, again, this is as a percentage of men's earnings, even in Los Angeles, women only earn nine, and this is across all of, you know, the surveyed uh, job types and that kind of thing. In general, women earn 91% of what men earn. And obviously, when we get down to um, analyzing pay based on, you know, intersectionality, Asian women, white women, black women, Latinas, we obviously know that the ratio gets even worse. And so, uh, in fact, women only have, in general, 70% of the retirement income of men. It's just a big, pervasive problem that has a lifelong impact for women um, and their families. So if we can just go to the next slide. The problem doesn't just exist in, in Los Angeles. I mean, these are big city maps that we're looking at here. Um, the gender pay ratio is even lower for women in San Francisco as of 2018. So again, these are great slides from the AAUW. Uh, and I suggest that you take a look at the information that they have. It's very, very interesting. Um, and gives you a sense of the big picture problem. So Mia, I think you're up next. Thanks. Um, so this is a snapshot at a more granular level of what's going on in Los Angeles where we all practice with respect to the pay gap. And this data is based on um, data reporting that it's collected by the DFEH. And as some of, uh, some of you may know, as of 2021, employers with 100 or more employees have to report their employment compensation data to the DFEH. Um, and they have to disaggregate it by job categories, gender, um, race, and ethnicity. So that's where this data is coming from. And if we look at the slide, we see, uh, oh no, the, sorry, Andy, yeah. So we'll see that we took two different cat job categories um, from the slides. We took what tends to be one of the highest paid categories within companies, which is executive senior managers. And then we took what tends to be one of the lowest paid minimum wage type of job categories, which is administrative support workers. And we looked at who made up each category. And as you can see, men and more specifically white men disproportionately represent the executive and senior managers who make up the higher pay bands. Um, while women of color and women disproportionately represent the lower pay bands like administrative support workers. And I think it's important to note that white men only comprise of approximately 16, that's one six percent of the employee population covered in these reports, yet 42.5 percent of executive or senior managers are white men. So it, it's looking at the granular data is really interesting and it kind of explains why we have this pay gap. Um, now Andy you can Go to the next slide, thank you. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about the pay gap versus pay inequity. So when we litigate equal pay cases, it's important to understand the distinction between the pay gap and pay inequity. The pay gap is something we can't really litigate over. The pay equity is, is something we can litigate over. So what's the pay gap? The pay gap is the numerical difference in average or medium wages among different demographic groups. So the numbers that we were going over earlier and that Jeannie was going over, that represents the pay gap. And some of the factors causing the pay gap um, include systemic barriers to women and persons of color, such as pregnancy, childcare costs, and access to formal education. There's also industry differences between historically female dominated industries that tend to be paid less than male dominated industries. An example of that would be education versus finance. Um, another cause of the pay gap is the difference in hours or years worked. Um, so that can be related to the systemic barriers where what women tend to have fewer hours um, and years worked due to pregnancy, due to frequent more frequently taking on childcare responsibilities, things like that. Um, another cause of the pay gap is bias, both conscious and unconscious. And that's where we get into pay and equity. So pay and equity is when pay disparities are caused by bias or discrimination. So these biases take many forms um, and including those that are listed in the slide. 
These are things that we litigate over in equal pay litigation. So it would include exacerbation of historical pay inequities by use of prior salary and pay decisions, which is illegal in California. Uh, funneling by leadership that's disproportionately represented by men, subjective decision making by managers, um, as who we saw in the prior slide, are disproportionately represented by men and white people, as well as conscious bias. So these were some of the things that were subject of the riot games litigation. And Andy, could you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Uh, so these are the key statutes that prohibit pay discrimination against California employees. So these include federal statutes as well as California statutes. Um, the federal statutes that cover pay discrimination are the Federal Equal Pay Act, the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act, the uh, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, which is uh, the, the employment discrimination law, and Title IX, which is the uh, education discrimination law. Those are all federal. The two key California statutes that prohibit pay discrimination are the California, California Equal Pay Act and the Fair Employment and Housing Act. And um, those are the two statutes that we relied on in the riot games case. So now um, Jeannie's gonna talk about the California Equal Pay Act. Thanks, Mia. Um, and to start off with, I think it's important, um, many of you may know this, but important to draw the distinction between the FIHA regarding gender discrimination and the California Equal Pay Act, uh, which is found at California Labor Code Section 1197.5. And I think one of the key distinctions here is that, of course, under the FIHA, one must demonstrate that women are paid less than men because of gender. And so uh, that, that act, you know, there has to be a substantial, gender has to be a substantial motivated reason. So there's an intent element, right? And that is absolutely one of the claims that was pursued in the Riot Games case. But I think what is incredibly powerful in these kinds of cases is the Equal Pay Act. And I do, it's important to us to talk about this because many people don't actually litigate in this area or handle these cases. And it's important um, to put this case in context by thinking about what the standards are um, and what we had, what we had to, to prove. Um, so to begin with, I'm gonna go through some of this because I think it's really important. Obviously here it says that an employer shall not pay any of its employees at wage rates less than the rates paid to employees of the opposite sex, very binary here, for substantially similar work. Right, and that's where a lot of the litigation happens is around what is substantially similar work when viewed as a composite of skill, effort, and responsibility. Again, a lot more of the litigation happens around what is that composite? What does that mean in these specific cases? And performed under similar working conditions. Again, another area um, of litigation, except where the employer demonstrates. So understand, and I guess I should just say, take note that what this calls for is the burden on the employer to demonstrate, right? That the wage differential is based upon one or more of the following factors, a seniority system, um, a merit system, a system that measures earnings by quantity or quality of production, um, and here's where, again, really a lot of litigation happens is a bona fide factor other than sex, such as education, training, or experience. And this language is just really fantastic for employees um, and, and fairly clear. The factor shall apply only if the employer demonstrates that the factor is not based on or derived from a sex-based differential in compensation is job related with respect to the position in question and is consistent with the business necessity. And again, down in the, the further bolded language further down, this defense shall not apply if the employee demonstrates, the employee demonstrates that an alternative business practice exists that would serve the same business purposes without producing the wage differential. There is a lot to figure out in discovery and litigate over 
in and in, in what we've just gone through uh, based on you know subsection A of Labor Code 1197.5. There's a ton to figure out there. Then each factor has to be relied upon. Um, each factor that is relied upon has to be applied reasonably. And the one or more factors relied upon uh, by the defendant uh, account for the entire wage differential. That's another significant burden as well. And those are things that, these are all things that we look at and test through our various regression analyses um, and through development of the facts of the case. And in this case, we're gonna talk sort of generally about those things later on. So if we can go to the next slide, Andy. So Mia mentioned this prior salary cannot justify any disparity in compensation. And that certainly applies with regard to the gender-based pay inequity analysis under the Equal Pay Act. So next slide, please, Andy. Now, what is fantastic about the Equal Pay Act in California is that it has a parallel um, uh, series of subsections that apply based on race or ethnicity. So this, I mean, you can think about this in terms of, you know, um, if, if there are African-American men who are being paid, uh, maybe accountants who are being paid less than, you know, Caucasian accountants or something like that. So you don't just have to fall directly into simply gender-based. And this allows, you know, I mean, you could be looking at intersectionality issues anyway, um, but it's important to understand that this is available um, as well. Uh, and it's, a, it's the same kind of structure. So we can just skip on to the, the next slide, which shows that again, even with regard to race and ethnicity, prior salary cannot justify any disparity in compensation. So next slide, Andy. All right, this is another important um, uh, requirement. Employers must maintain records of the wages and wage rates, job classifications, other terms and conditions of employment um, for people employed by the employer for uh, three years. Um, so that is that the, the failure, the alleged failure to keep such records was at issue in the case as well, in the Riot Games case. And um, here's subsection H talks about what the employee is entitled to recover if there's a violation of the Equal Pay Act in California. They can recover in a civil action, the balance of the wages, so the wage disparity, including interest, and an equal amount as liquidated damages together with the cost of the suit and reasonable attorney's fees. So you can see where this can add up very quickly, very substantially. Um, and then subsection I, uh, in addresses the issue of um, really when an action can be commenced and the statute uh, of limitations, it's gonna be commenced no later than two years after the cause of action occurs, um, which is the time of the, uh, uh, of the Equal Pay Act violation. Um, and then if it's a willful violation, it can be, you can go back three years. Okay, so let's go on to the next slide. All right, so this is the anti-retaliation provision of the Equal Pay Act. Um, and I think one of the things that's important to know about this is employers cannot prohibit employees from disclosing the employee's own wages, discussing the wages of others, inquiring about another employee's wages, or aiding or encouraging any other employee to exercise their rights under the section. So that's very broad and very helpful, intended to make sure that employees are able to to talk to one another about what they're earning because that's one of the really one of the only ways that they're going to figure out do they have a violation that's occurring um all right next slide okay so this i wanted to point out this is just california labor code section 432.3 and this um uh, i think was effective in 2019 if i'm recalling correctly um, and it applies to contracts and applicants for employment. And with regard to applicants, so when an employer is interviewing applicants for employer, uh, em employment, um, they cannot rely on salary history information uh, as a factor in determining whether to offer employment. 
um, or what salary to offer that applicant. Um, and the employer is not uh, to personally or through an agent, uh, like a recruiter, seek salary history information, including compensation and benefits. And the employer um, must, upon reasonable request, provide pay scale for a position to an applicant who's applying for employment. Upon reasonable request means a request made after the applicant has completed an initial interview with the employer, um, the prospective employer. And so next slide. All right. Um, you know, an applicant for employment can voluntarily and without prompting um, disclose salary history. Um, and, it, you know, if they do, um, then then an employer can take that into consideration in determining the salary for that applicant. Um, now, here's an important thing for employers. Nothing in this section prohibits the employer from asking about the applicant's salary expectation for the position being applied for. So next slide, Andy. What that means is when you're interviewing employees, employer or prospective employees, employers, you say, what are your salary expectations? You don't say how much are you currently paid or how much were you paid in this position at that prior employer. Um, and I think that that's important because there are actually surprisingly quite a few people who aren't aware of this. Um, all right, and let's see, one more slide for me, I think, Andy. Oh, yes, okay, so here's what's coming up. And I, I wanna tell you that actually, this is a revision, a proposed revision to Labor Code Section 432.3. And um, it is currently pending. It is, I think, just made it out. Uh, it's set for the third reading in front of the Senate. Um, and so what's important to me about this to point out is that an employer, that this broadens the obligation that an employer has so that an employer, upon request, will have to provide the pay scale for the position to a person who's currently employed. So far, we've been talking about California Labor Code 432.3 as it applies to applicants for employment. Um, and those, those disclosures of um, pay ranges, pay scales, uh, weren't um, codified in, that, would, that would apply to and be provided for current employees, just applicants. So this legislation proposes to fix that it, as I said, it is headed into its, I think, third reading um, in the Senate. And um, again, you'll just see here that there, it, this requires employers to ma maintain uh, records of job description and wage rate history for each employee for the duration of their employment plus three years. Um, and the employer is supposed to, if they engage a third party um, to pursue hiring, um, uh, then they have to disclose the pay scale uh, to the agent, the third party, and to the applicants in the job posting. So that, I think, is a really important big picture about what the California Equal Pay Act um, provides for and requires um, and sets up, I think, pretty nicely the discussion about what was going on in this case. Nick? All right. Okay, everyone. So now I'm going to get into a little bit about this case specifically. Um, so the case is McCracken versus Riot Games. Andy, if you want to jump to the next slide. <clears throat> so kind of to give you everyone a procedural background on the case. Um, so this case was filed in November of 2018 on behalf of two plaintiffs uh, serving as the putative class representatives. It was uh, class claims as well as a PAGA claim. And I'm sure everybody knows about PAGA. I think we did a webinar about that a couple of months ago. Um, so that was the, the case was not just an equal pay lawsuit. It also included several FIHA causes of action, gender discrimination, sexual harassment, et cetera. Um, it was filed by counsel other than myself and uh, Jeannie's firm. And there was a proposed settlement that was submitted for preliminary approval in two, at the end of 2019. Uh, what ended up happening was that the government in the background had been conducting some investigations and ultimately some government entities, the DLSE and the DFEH objected to the settlement. The objections were never ruled on. Um, we were brought into the case and the settlement was withdrawn. 
Um, the DLSC intervened and then the DFEH subsequently, subsequently intervened in the case. Um, also, once we took on the case, we added some additional class representatives. Now, one of the tough things that we're always dealing with in employment law um, is the fact that many of our people have arbitration agreements, and that was present in this case. Uh, lots of folks have arbitration agreements, and as everyone knows, uh, arbitration agreements can have class action waivers. So there was motions to compel arbitration, and six of the seven plaintiffs were compelled to arbitration. However, one remained, and she continued to be our, she continues to be our class representative to this day. Uh, the other plaintiffs also had PAGA claims, and they were actually remained in the case. And normally speaking, oftentimes what will happen when you have an individual claim with a PAGA attachment is that the trial court will usually stay the uh, PAGA case, stay the civil action pending the outcome of the arbitration. In this case, uh, Judge Burrell, who's our trial judge in this case, did not do that. He actually allowed the case to continue forward, including the arbitration in the class. and so. Six of the seven women's equal pay fee hawk places were compelled to arbitration. Our class representative remained. So our case, along with the government action, proceeded forward. Um, so, um, oh, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, can I jump in? And I just wanna, I wanna point out that um, we actually worked with the DFEH um, because of those arbitration agreements. So you wanna speak to that and, uh, and about a, a little bit about why, well, I mean, well, many, many plaintiff's lawyers do that or know the reason why plaintiff's employment lawyers, but others don't. So do you want to address that substantive issue, Nick? Yeah, so one of the big things is the DFEH cannot be compelled to arbitration. I mean, simple as that. They can't be compelled to arbitration, neither can the DLSE. So in that manner, you're able to work together with them in unison to prosecute the action. So it's helpful. I mean, they have certain government powers that, you know, that that adds some gravitas to the case. So so it was useful working with the DFEH and the DLSC um, on this matter. So once the once once we basically had the certain women getting compelled to arbitration, we had everything now aligned going forward, our case, the government action, um, then the discovery stays were lifted. Because um, it's in complex court, so usually there's a discovery stay automatically on these class actions. So that was lifted, and then we were able to commence discovery, which the important thing in, in these cases is when you have large class groups and you're doing, particularly I want to focus on the equal pay side of this, you're going to get huge amounts of data. And it's extremely important to get that data through the discovery and get it to qualified experts. All right, that's extremely important. And so there was extensive written discovery, meet and confers back and forth. Um, you know, the parties were adversarial but professional, you know. So it was, it was, it was, it was a tough, tough time going, let me put it that way. Um, ultimately, we got the data that was necessary. We were able to, and we'll go into a little more detail some of the, uh, the expert work that was done. Uh, we were able to posture the case to get it to a point where we could resume negotiations um, because there had been several mediations, prior counsel, us. Um, and so we were able to get it back in. And, and something that was interesting that was done in this case, and it had been done in a previous case that I was not a part of, but I believe Jeannie was a part of, was something we did here was we actually had a private mediator along with a mandatory settlement conference judge. And we had them assisting us in, in the resolution discussion. So in this case, we had Mark Rudy as our private mediator and we had now retired judge Daniel Buckley serving as our mandatory settlement conference judge. And so judge Buckley and Mark Rudy actually worked together at, in, in helping us resolve the case. And it was an extremely lengthy process to the point that, um, I mean, this was multiple MSC slash mediations over the course of three weeks. Um, I mean, I really have to commend Judge Buckley in particular because I mean, he was, you know, very busy schedule on his own and he really made a lot of time for us 
to, to really help us through, including, you know, multiple late night conference calls on Sunday evenings, things like that. So I can't say enough good things about Judge Buckley. He's fantastic. Yeah. Um, Nick, can I jump in for just a second? Yeah, please go ahead. I do. I, do, I, I want to echo that and then also um, put a, make a real fine point on this, which is that in Los Angeles, we're very lucky that the Superior Court, LASC, is willing to think outside the box about ways to assist parties to get cases, um, you know, at least to the point where negotiations are happening. And in this situation, I mean, obviously Judge Buckley um, is the former presiding judge. He was then sitting in the complex court and he had been for, you know, a number of years at that point um, after he, you know, probably at least two or three years at that point. And so it was really valuable to have um, a, a sitting complex for judges perspective about, you know, I mean, I'm, obviously it's mediation, so I can't get into details, but just procedural things, issues that are going to come up with regard to how you frame the settlement, this, you know, a settlement agreement, what the court is going to approve and not approve with regard to a class action and, you know, PAGA claims. So it was really valuable to have that combination of, of course, Mark Rudy being, you know, one of the top um, most experienced uh, employment mediators in the state, if not the country, who's handled a lot of big complex cases and class actions, employment class actions, plus um, a sitting complex court judge. And the way we got into that very unique um, M combo MSC mediation um, was that we ultimately uh, stipulated with Riot Games, the plain, private plaintiffs and Riot Games um, stipulated to uh, request an MSC, um, which uh, at, at that point, Judge Burrell granted, um, approved the stipulation and DFEH and DLSC then elected to participate in that process. And so I agree, you know, both Mark Rudy and Judge Buckley, especially Judge Buckley, who, you know, is, is not getting paid separately at that point, because he's a sitting judge, he's not a, me he's not a mediator. Um, there's so much time that they each put in um, an effort to work out all of the issues um, and, and keep the parties moving forward. This was not a foregone conclusion not by any stretch of the imagination. This is probably one of the most complex and difficult um, MSC slash mediation processes in which I have ever been involved. And I've been involved in some complex ones. So um, I just wanted to point those things out and say to all of you practitioners out there that this, you know, this unique type of request in an appropriate case to the Superior Court, um, it's something that you should consider and it's something that, that may very well be granted, okay? Thanks, Nick. Yeah. And I will say too that, I mean, even though we're all plaintiff's attorneys speaking right now, but I mean, I think, you know, as a former defense lawyer too, I mean, it's just great having a judge in there because I think it helps with everybody's clients. I, I, I really think that coupled with the skills of a private mediator like Mark Rudy, I mean, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a great combo. So, yeah, so after, you know, extensive, I mean, I think we started MSC slash mediations in October. They continued all the way through to mid to late November. Um, and then negotiating terms of what turned out to be a pretty unique settlement because of the involvement of the government. It wasn't just a class action settlement. This also had to be a consent decree as well. So that took extensive amounts of a negotiation, ultimately resulting in an overall settlement of $100 million plus programmatic relief, which also has some financial attachments to it. Um, due to some costs associated with, uh, with implementing the programmatic relief. And that was submitted to the court in December of 2021. And it took 
until late July of this year to get preliminary approval, um, not because of any significant issues with the settlement, but just like we've all experienced, you know, getting things on court's calendars is pretty brutal. Um, so, um, so we're right now we're at the preliminary, we've just had preliminary approval granted, and we're in the process of the class administration with a final approval hearing date of December 1. So that's where it stands procedurally, um, just kind of as an overall summary. Um, if you can go to the next slide. Um, this is just a, a summary of the claims that were asserted. So we had claims under the Fair Employment and Housing Act, sex, gender harassment, discrimination. So you have both a claim of equal paid discrimination under FEHA, where you have to show intent, versus our EPA claim, no intent required, retaliation, failure to prevent, uh, UCL, PAGA claims. Um, all of these were asserted um, in the original complaint, and we kept everything going forward. Um, and so those were the, the legal claims and theories that were brought forth that are now being resolved. So let's go to, um, oh, I think go to the next slide. And I think that's gonna, we're gonna pass this over to the wonderful Andy Fields who can talk about class member stories. Go right ahead, Andy. Is it okay, Andy, if I just jump in and set the scene for your involvement? Sure. Okay, so when the case came to me, I reached out to Joe Labredovich and Nick Saris um, and asked them to join us in this case because it was gonna be a lot of work, uh, which is great and fine. Um, but at my firm, we take relatively few cases for litigation at any point in time because we wanna be able to put in maximum effort. And so when we joined together, I knew that the women of Riot Games um, deserved to have a real single point of contact, mostly that they could always rely on, that they could pretty much always get a hold of, um, and that you know we needed to have somebody who was assigned to the women um, to speak with them and also develop relationships and you know help us. We knew that we were going to be interviewing a lot of people. Um, and developing the facts, and it was going to be an extensive, extensive effort. So the by far most, um, I think, approachable, nice, wonderful, outstanding, you know, on the phone with clients, person, individual in this firm is, is Andy Fields. And so I asked Andy if she would be, please, the point of contact um, for the clients, the witnesses, um, and she agreed and took that job very seriously. And I am telling you, she's gonna to talk to you about what she did, but it was an extraordinary effort. And without every single hour that she spent um, and every single call that she made, we wouldn't have had the information that we needed to get the outcome in this case. So that is the framework. Now, Andy, to you. Thanks, Jeannie. So um, as Jeannie mentioned, um, I was the point of contact for all of the class members, potential class members, et cetera. Um, reaching out to these individuals was definitely um, an interesting thing to do during a pandemic, um, having a lawyer randomly call your phone um, in the midst of a pandemic is certainly fun for those folks. Um, so uh, over 600 of our firm hours um, were spent interviewing more than 200 women and men. Um, we did extensive interviews. I did extensive interviews with um, anyone and everyone who would talk to us, anyone who had a story that they felt that they need to share or, or who felt that they were impacted in any type of way. This was also a great way for us to kind of understand the day-to-day -day and be able to um, really, really just get a deep knowledge of what these women were going through while working for Riot Games. Um, when the case came to us, there was, were two class representatives, um, as uh, everyone mentioned already. I think it was mentioned a couple times by now. So um, we've had a total, um, to this date, we've had a total of eight class representatives, and I'm going to walk you through how we got there. So um, when this case came to us, it started with two class representatives. Before it came to us, a third was added. 
uh, right before uh, we became class counsel, um, one of the class members had been removed, one of the class representatives had been removed. Um, after taking on the case, we added five additional class representatives. Um, in January of 2021, uh, six of those class representatives were compelled to arbitration, but did remain our PAGA representatives. And one of our original class representatives remained. Um, at the time of preliminary approval, our total class size is estimated to be 2,365 women. That's broken down to 1,065 female employees that were given full-time benefits, et cetera, and 1,300 female temporary contract workers. Um, there are, as, um, as part of the materials that were given out with this, um, with this webinar, you'll be able to see um, our consent decree that does break down um, how how those differences occur and what um, what that means for our settlement. And now it goes on to Nick. All right. So statistical analysis. So I'm a lawyer. I'm bad at math. Um, so statistical analysis. When you have a class of, you know, whether it's two hundred or two thousand and you're talking about equal pay, we are talking about massive amounts of data, right? And so if you're gonna litigate one of these cases, one thing you have to be prepared, prepared for is the large amount of expert fees you're going to incur. So, I mean, you know, keep eyes wide open when you're going into these cases. So in this situation, what we're doing is we had to obtain all of the pay data, and then we had to, oftentimes you have to get it into usable format. You know, sometimes you're going to get PDFs of documents, sometimes you're going to get Excel spreadsheets. All of this stuff needs to be put into a usable format for your experts, which took a lot of data processing um, by outside entities. Um, and then you get all of this data, you make sure you got some very well-established experts, extremely important. We ended up having uh, two different economists take a look at this. We had our lead economists who handled the heavy lifting on everything, um, hundreds and hundreds of hours. Um, and then we had a second expert who had served as an expert in another similar equal pay class action come in to check everything again, right? I mean, we were really cautious in making sure that our analysis were appropriate. And the reason being is that when you're looking at any type of EPA claim on a class-wide basis, you're going to be using regression models with various controls. And you have to be prepared to understand what it is that, that the defense in any case is going to do in order to try and disaggregate your models, right? So the question is, you know, you have to start, you get all this data inputted, and then you start inserting controls. So in, in, in an equal pay case based on gender, you're gonna start with gender as your control and you're gonna go across the entire class and your expert is gonna come up with standard deviations which and, and odds of probability as to these pay discrepancies and what the odds are. And all of this stuff is very, very powerful. Now, the thing is, is that if you go back to some of the earlier slides, whenever you do this at a company because of the systemic gender discrimination that's occurred for you know hundreds of years, the reality is, is that oftentimes you're going to have man management being predominated by men and women in more of an administrative capacity. It's, it's, it's just what you see in the data. And the one thing you can't do is just control for gender, because if you just control for gender, um, then what you're going to end up having is the defense is going to be able to say, yeah, but you're comparing the CEO to the administrative assistant. That's, that's not going to work your analysis is going to get thrown out. No judge is going to take that with any weight and, you know, get ready for your summary judgment to be granted. Um, so gender starts your first control. Now you got to start taking away other controls. And what you're using is you're using the statute that's saying like, look here, these are the bona fide basis for actually qualifications, you know, standards that an employer can use to justify pay disparity. And so what you need to do then is you need to start then talking to your expert and start feeding in additional controls. 
Now that can get difficult, obviously, because when you're getting a lot of this, let's say, you know, we're talking about a sample size of say a thousand people, right? So you're getting, you know, multiple years of pay. Now, remember this lawsuit was filed back in 2018. You're going far back, you know, you got four years on a UCL claim, right? So you're getting data from there up until, you know, 2021, you're getting these massive amounts of data. Now, how are you supposed to go through and start figuring out, you know, okay, let me look at everybody's resume. I mean, that's, that's extremely difficult to do. So you have to figure out ways that with your expert in order to control for certain things. Now, luckily, a lot of the things that you can get in these data points that you can control for, for example, are tenure. You can get start date and end dates. And so you can do a tenure control. So now you, your first regression model is just with gender. And now you have uh, a standard deviation. You say, wow, look at this. This is, this is a, a seven standard deviation. The odds of this are one in who knows what, right? Now we start controlling for things. We throw in tenure. Okay, we have the start and end date. So our expert can factor that into their model. And now you start saying, okay, well, where does that standard deviation lie, right? Because, you know, at some point, if, because what you're really looking for, honestly, you're not looking to find the equal pay violation when you do one of these cases. If you go in with that mentality, you're opening yourself up to exposure because you're going to have problems. You're going to give yourself glaring areas where somebody can attack you. So you got to be really honest with yourself in controlling for these things and just taking it where the data takes you, right? So tenure is one thing you can start controlling for, and it's data you can get. You can also get data from employers on the department people worked in, right? So, I mean, you're going to have in any company, you know, you can't compare all the departments necessarily together. You know, maybe, um, you know, I mean, if you take a school, for example, are you going to be able to compare the administrative staff to the janitorial staff? No, they're on different pay scales, right? So you can start controlling for department. And that's, again, information to get from them and give to your expert. Next thing you want to look at is what are these people doing? What are their actual, actual jobs? Now, this gets tricky because you do have to recognize that in cases, oftentimes, the job title is, is not necessarily what these people are doing, right? I mean, you can get these equal pay cases where part of the problem is that employers are not promoting women but with titles, but giving them the same exact job duty. But you do need to factor that in and have your model prepared to say, look, I've, I've factored in that too, just to take a look at it and see. Now, part of the thing is you keep going through this experience. How long has the person been in the field? Well, that's, that can get tricky, again, because how much data can you input? You can certainly use age as a proxy. Um, so you can get, obviously, the date of birth. That's something that your expert can use. Um, you can delve into the more detail too and get relevant years of experience. But again, age is something that's a good proxy as well. Location, if your company has different sites, that's something you got to look for. Obviously, pay scales in Los Angeles are going to be different than pay scales in, you know, Hemet, right? I mean, it's just, there's different values associated with it. So all of these things are what you're getting into and you're having your expert create multiple regression analysis based on all of these controls. Uh, now, another thing you have to look for is the actual compensation. You have to look at what types of compensation people are receiving. Are they just receiving base salaries? Are they, on, um, are, are they being paid commissions? Are they pay, paying bonuses? Are they being, paying, being paid stock options? You know, all of these things that have to come into play, and then you have to get into valuations of those as well. So when you're looking at just wage, also think of it more holistically and look at it also based on what type of benefits. I mean, sometimes some companies might have different benefit plans for different levels, right? So you're looking at all of this information and your, your expert is now getting it to you in a usable fashion where ultimately at the end of the day, when you're going in to mediation or when you're going to you know, def defend a summary judgment motion or you're going to trial, you know, you're going to be able to say, look, you know, let's start with these controls. And here we go. Standard deviation here is high, 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 as I add in more controls. And that presents you with a really compelling case, right? Um, the other thing to think about, too, is whenever you want to try and attack some of these controls, like, for example, 
job position, right? If you want to say, well, you shouldn't compare a vice president to a manager, right? Well, what you need to do then, and that's one thing that Andy's really importance lies in is talking to all of these people who could be class reps to get the actual evidence to establish, to try and knock out a control, to say, listen, I think that you can't control this issue anymore because the evidence there just doesn't doesn't support the application of it because it's not consistently applied, which the law requires. So that's basically generally the way that the statistical analysis works um, in these types of cases. And I'm going to pass it off to Mia now to, uh, to talk next. So I'll just briefly talk about the monetary terms of the class settlement. So the monetary settlement is for $100 million. Um, that covers approximately 2,300 class members. Um, and the class members are female employees and female contractors in California who worked at any time from November of 2014 to December of 2021 for Riot Games. Uh, and about half of the class members were employee or are employees and about half of them are contractors. Um, the average recovery for each class member, assuming 100% participation, um, is $32,558. So that's pretty significant. Um, and that's assuming 100% participation. Um, under the settlement agreement, each class member is going to get a minimum payment, regardless of whether they opt out of the class action. Um, and that payment covers the PAGA penalty, because as many of you probably know, you can't opt out of the PAGA penalty. Um, that payment's $2,500 for contractors and $5,000 for employees. So those, so everyone's going to get that, and they can still choose to, to opt out. Um, the remaining payments are divided among class members who do not opt out of the class. And it's based on tenure and status as an employee or contractor. So the monetary settlements, that, that portion of the monetary settlements divided into basically three categories. Um, there's an amount that's based on when the employment began. There's a second category that's an additional payment of $40,000 for employees who began prior to 2016. And then there's a third category that's an additional payment based on the total number of months worked, which is based on a point system. Uh, the range of recovery for participating class members is going to range from over $7,500 to over $80,000. And I'm now going to pass the baton to Andy to talk about the significant programmatic relief. Before we do that, um, because I hadn't done it before, let me just jump in and explain Mia's role in this litigation, which um, as you heard in Andy's outstanding introduction of Mia, Mia has, um, you know, I think for 10 years of litigating in California and trial experience, um, beginning with working with equal rights advocates and working on women's rights um, uh, cases and litigation. She has meticulous attention to detail. She is an outstanding, um, litigator and um, and trial attorney. Yeah, I'm going to say um, newer trial attorney. <laughs> okay, and not not younger, newer. And um, because uh, those like me, we've had a few more years. Um, so at any rate, that and and Mia, Nick, and I um, basically divided up uh, the litigation work. Um, the law in motion, the dealing with the experts, the economists, the statistician, um, dealing with opposing counsel, et cetera, et cetera. So that's how we structured the responsibilities. And um, thank you, Mia, for all of your outstanding work as well. All right. Okay, Andy, back to you. Okay, well, I agree with all those sentiments about Mia and um, our team, everybody worked really hard to do that. Um, so one of the other really equally important um, parts of this settlement um, is the programmatic relief. Um, one of the things that was most important to the women from day one was ensuring that 
change happened. And so the way we were to able to effectuate that is through programmatic relief. Um, here's a little snippet of the programmatic relief that um, we obtained in the consent decree. Again, it's in your materials if you wanna read the, the, the full nitty gritty of that. So um, Riot will reserve $6 million um, over the three years for the programmatic relief. Um, that will go to independent experts to conduct pay, promotion, hiring analysis, um, and to remedy any disparities that have been found um, on, an, on an ongoing basis, and obviously from what this case originated from. Um, there will also be separate independent audits of compliance with discrimination, harassment, and retaliation law. Um, there will be an annual pay data report provided to employees. This is a big one for um, many of the women involved. And there will be a centralized database to um, maintain complaints made at Riot. So when, when women or anyone, for that matter, makes a complaint, there will be a centralized place where Riot's um, human resources will be able to collect and maintain all of those complaints. Um, also, one of the main points was that there will be changes to hiring practices. Um, it will become a more objective process. This will be great for um, women and um, anyone else coming into Riot um, looking to get a, an objective hire, looking to get it just better, right? Um, let's see, there will be um, one of the big ones um, will be that uh, there are procedures put in place for 40 contract position contractors to be hired as full-time employees. Um, they will, um, what Riot will do is that they will, will work through the hiring process until 40 positions from contractors um, are filled. And that's a really big one for our women as well. And then um, Mia, I'm gonna pass it back to you for a minute. Um, so the next two slides are just kind of for everyone to look at on their own. Um, this one has some key case law that I think is probably helpful for um, people who are litigating equal pay and equal pay class actions. Um, so that is this first slide. And then Andy, could you go to the next slide, please? And then this is a list of recent equal pay litigation that's notable and extremely interesting. Um, Ellis v. Google is especially one for anyone who's involved in equal pay class litigation to look at because class cert was granted in that case for a class of 15,500 employees uh, based on statistical evidence. So that, that's very significant. And then, of course, they got they also got a great um, settlement. Um, the other cases you can look up, but uh, the Oracle case was similar to Google, except it, it didn't go so well. Um, in that case, the Morgan v. U.S. Soccer Federation case is a case that I'm sure we're all familiar with that uh, Megan Rapino kind of headed where uh, a motion for summary judgment was granted against the plaintiff, the plaintiffs in an equal pay litigation brought by Megan Rapino and her soccer team. Uh, but then the PR, really, they won the PR battle, and they ended up getting a $24 million class settlement. Um, the Jones Day case is interesting because uh, it was an equal pay class action that the plaintiffs ended up voluntarily dismissing after the defendants disclosed all of the pay data, and they had litigated for a year, for a very long time. It was expensive litigation where Jones Day was trying not to disclose this pay data. And when it finally did, the plaintiffs dropped the case. So defense, you know, employers just produce the pay data. <laughs> so that's, that's uh, kind of it for this slide. Awesome. Well, thanks for that, Mia. So um, we have a few questions. So I'll start with the first one. How did one plaintiff escape arbitration? Was there no arbitration agreement? Correct. 
the easy answer. Okay, our next question. Was the distribution of the settlement part of the mediation process negotiated and determined through the mediators? If so, can you speak to other various considerations that did not make it to the final settlement? Um, I'm going to say, yeah, everything, everything was negotiated. <laughs> So um, what you see in the settlement terms and the structure is a result of the entire negotiation process. So I can't talk about um, the things that didn't make it into the public record. And I'm sure everybody will understand that. That's my best answer. Awesome. Well, thank you, Jeannie, Nick, and Mia for joining us tonight. And thank you to all of our attendees. We are done. Feel free to reach out to us um, individually if you have any questions. Thanks so much. We'll see you next month for our next Beverly Hills Bar Association program.